So as part of this talk, uh, we're going to be considering outcomes of poor nutritional intake in adults. So as part of this uh, topic over overview, we're going to look at uh, poor nutritional intake in adults. So we're going to look at how um, this can be defined, what, what are some of the definitions of malnutrition, what is the must tool, so um, and looking at food first approach. And then together we will look at the outcomes of poor nutritional intake in children with a special reference to food allergy and the impact of poor nutritional status on growth. And then we will contrast over and under nutrition and the double burden of malnutrition, and then look on look on the uh, look at the longer term impact on health um, and disease of both. So at the end of this uh, topic, you should be able to identify uh, what classifications are used to define malnutrition in adults, be able to understand the impact of poor nutritional intake in children on growth, and be able to characterize the double burden of malnutrition and be able to quantify how individuals in the world are affected by obesity. So why is malnutrition a problem? So malnutrition is very common and it's a common health problem. And in the UK, there are 3 million people who are estimated to have malnutrition at any one time. So the British Association of Parental and Enteral Nutrition estimates um, between 30 and 40% of people are admitted to hospital or care homes in the UK are malnourished or at risk of becoming undernourished. Um, so what's caused, what, 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 why does malnutrition happen? So it's either as a result of an inadequate diet, poor appetite or a problem absorbing nutrients from the food. So maybe people don't feel well enough to eat or they're dysphoric, they don't have um, enough, um, they lack capacity to be able to meet, maybe they have dementia and they've forgotten that they've eaten. Um, or maybe they have um, intestinal failure, so it causes a problem with absorbing. So there are many reasons why this may happen. Um, so um, individuals, adults who've had a recent stay in hospital, um, if they've been really unwell, um, it may take them some time to rehabilitate, um, and that becomes exacerbated uh, because maybe they have a poor appetite. Um, the drugs that they are sent home with impact on their taste um, and the smell of food, um, or they feel weak, um, so they feel unable to cook or cook for themselves, um, or they just have no interest in food. Um, individuals could have a long-term health condition, or they could have a lack of mobility. They may have a low income, so not be able to afford the amount of food that's required to keep them healthy, um, and or they may have a, suffered a recent bereavement um, or be socially isolated. So the most common signs adults may be at risk of malnutrition is unintentional weight loss um, in the last of three to six months. Um, adults complaining of weak muscles, uh, tiredness, low mood, um, an increased risk or an increase in illnesses or infections and an increased risk of falls. So what are the consequences of malnutrition? Why, do we, why, why are we so concerned? So if, you, if an individual is malnourished, they have poor wound healing. So that means if they are in hospital, they have an increased risk of staying longer. Um, or if they're in at home, um, a sore on their foot could get bigger. And that obviously then um, it's associated with an infection risk. Um, they have reduced muscle function. So this uh, reduces their respiratory muscle function. So they have an increased risk of um, chest infections. Um, they have general fatigue, so it they become quite dysphoric and they have low mood and just don't want to cook. Um, increased risk of infection, um, impaired immune response. So again, it increases their risk of infection. Um, so if you think about protein turnover and your hyperplasia and your hypertrophy, if you don't have enough food, then you don't have new cells um, um, generating. So that includes your immune cells. So therefore your risk of infection increases. Apathy, depression, self-neglect, and this all re um, can result in increased length of hospital stay and an increased risk of morbidity and mortality, and obviously increased risk of healthcare costs. So how do we recognise malnutrition? So obviously in adults, we record their weight loss. Um, one of the common things to ask um, individuals is, you know, are their clothes more loose fitting than usual? Um, what about their rings or jewellery that they wear? Do they look 
visually thin? Do they look emaciated? Is there evidence of muscle wasting? So um, their arms, is there evidence of muscle wasting on their legs? Uh, do they have the pre presence of pressure ulcers? And do they have a high must score? And do they appear um, depressed or apathetic? So what is MUST? MUST is uh, the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, and it was developed um, as part of Bay Pen at Southampton. Um, and it takes five, it's a five-step tool used to identify someone's risk of malnutrition. So MUST um, is a screening tool for malnutrition, so it's the first step. So it's not a nutritional assessment, but it is a screening tool um, who may be at risk um, of uh, potentially at risk of malnutrition. Each patient should be screened on admission or within 24 hours of admission and MUST should be repeated on all patients weekly in an inpatient setting. MUST enables appropriate early intervention um, and continued, um, so it allows for monitoring and better outcomes of, of patients. MUST has been designed to help identify who are underweight and at risk of malnutrition, as well as those who are obese but it's not designed to detect deficiencies or excessive intakes of micronutrients. Um, it has been validated and shown to work. Um, it's universal, can be used in all adults and in all settings, um, and it should obtain the same results. The difficulty is, is that it's often very difficult to implement. Um, so although it seems quite simple and easy to use um, on a practical day-to-day -day basis, actually it's, uh, it's often not well used um, and certainly uh, compliance with must screening is actually quite poor. So where should it be used? Uh, it should be routinely used for all patients admitted to hospital and care homes, uh, new patients attending GP surgeries, all outpatients of first clinic appointments and health check and flu injections. So it looks at BMI um, and as we know that BMI is um, not really a very sensitive, um, it doesn't describe body composition so it just describes body habitus, so it describes um, the relationship to body weight and height. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a very muscular person who's, for example, a bodybuilder, they may have a very high BMI, but they're not obese. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, it's not, it doesn't tell you what type of body composition someone has, but it's it's a crude measure of uh, body habitus. So someone with a low um, BMI, so less than 18.5, and someone with a higher BMI, so more than 25 is considered overweight, more than 30 is obese. Um, it, it um, is a predictor from that perspective of loss, of, of risk. So you have step one plus step two, weight loss score, uh, and plus step three. So is there a, a disease or nutritional intake that may, um, a disease that may impact on nutritional intake or something that may increase losses? Um, and then you combine all those sc scores together to determine the overall risk, and then you imp implement appropriate management guidelines. So why is it important uh, to calculate the BMI? It gives you an idea that if there's a healthy weight for height or if they're underweight. So the healthy range is between 18 and, 18 and a half and 25. Um, I said less than 18.5 is underweight and more than 30 is obese. Excuse me. To calculate um, BMI, you times height by height. That gives you meters squared. And then you take the kilograms and you divide it by the weight. Um, and that will give you a um, numerical number that will relate to a BMI, which you can then use to classify. So this um, chart here shows you some classification. So you measure the height and weight, use the BMI chart to determine the score. You find the height along the scale. Uh, you find the weight going up. So from height is um, vertical, um, scale is horizontal, um, and then you meet in the middle. Um, join the meeting point and the actual number at which the meeting point is the BMI. So the BMI um, score will depend on coloured bands in which the BMI falls. Um, so white or green is naught, um, yellow is one and red is two. Um, so obviously therefore there is a difference. So this person on the um, Left hand side probably has a normal BMI, whereas the person on the right hand side has is thin um, and probably has a low BMI. So it's really important to determine an accurate weight. Um, and it sounds really simple to do, but it's uh, lots of mistakes are made all the time. 
So you need to first make sure that uh, the patient is sat or stood on the scales correctly. So they haven't got one foot on the floor or um, they are mid-centre. Um, be aware of extra fluid being carried around. So are they carrying a bag of water or some ascites? Check the scales are naught and calibrated. Ensure similar clothing is worn in each way. So you might want to say, have a, a standard operating procedure where um, patients uh, or individuals only stand in their, the lightest of clothing. Um, so ensure that the patient isn't leaning on anything um, and set similar times each day uh, to be weighed because obviously it varies. So ulna length, um, ulna length um, which is the bone um, between your elbow and your hand, um, can be used to estimate height. Um, so the arm should be bent left arm if possible, um, as identified in the picture. You measure in centimetres and then you use a table to find um, an estimate of the height below. Um, and that's if you're not able, so for example, if patients are bed bound um, and they can't stand up. Uh, this is quite useful. Middle operand circumference is another useful measure of uh, to quantify um, risk. It is not sensitive in identifying body composition um, because it doesn't discriminate between fat and muscle, uh, but it will tell you um, how thin or overweight um, someone is or normal weight. So if you're very thin, your middle operand muscle circumference will be low. Um, so, for example, um, current weight um, and then the weight uh, three to six months ago. So you can look at the weight loss score. So if they've lost um, weight, uh, this will tell you how much, um, what is their risk? So is it green, amber or red? An acute disease um, effect score. If the patient is acutely ill and they, they there is likely to be no nutritional intake for more than five days and they get a score of two. Um, and then, then add, add the scores all up. So add from step one, two and three. Um, and this gives you an overall risk of malnutrition. So the lowest possible score is naught. The highest possible score is six. So naught is the low risk of malnutrition. Um, score one is a medium risk of malnutrition and two or more is a high risk of malnutrition. So then implementation, what are you going to do about it? So then you need to think about an appropriate must-care plan, treat and refer as appropriate, monitor, repeat, and then do it all over again each week. So in general, um, where if you're trying to affect, um, if you're trying to provide nutrition support, a food-first approach is really important. Um, so we try not to just go straight for oral nutrition supplements or enteral feeds. Um, we would always try and fortify meals and snacks. Um, nut butters are really good. So nut butters are a fantastic food matrix. Uh, they contain everything. So they've got um, fat, um, a little bit of carbohydrate, but they've got protein, micronutrients. Um, so in um, developing countries, they use ready to use therapeutic food, uh, which is a combination of nut butter and um, some form of additional milk or soya uh, protein um, and some micronutrients added. And this is a very uh, nutrient dense um, form of food and that can be added to food. So you could add nut butters to porridge, nut butters to main meals um, or have it as a stack. Then there's butter, cream, cheese, full fat, milk, mayonnaise and oil. Um, but often it's really important to bear in mind that if you add things like butter, cream and cheese, um, it can delay gastric emptying. So it can make people feel more uh, nauseous if they are already or feel full for longer. Um, oral supplements, so SIP supplements can usually provide around 300 calories. Um, they can be beneficial to many patients with long term conditions, but they really shouldn't be used as first line. Um, so we, uh, we should be using them to supplement meals rather than replace meals. So the problem with um, oral, oral nutrition supplements or ONS as it's um, referred to is that it can often negatively detract from um, actual meals, um, which isn't really the point. So the whole variety of different ONS um, supplements out there, both for in-hospital use and in the community use. Um, so this is a um, small uh, paper um, that we looked at um, variation in nutrition practice amongst 
community prescribing dietitians um, and we found that um, ONS was uh, routinely prescribed but actually didn't do anything so it didn't change um, didn't improve their weight um, over a 12-week period and um, so it was a, of no benefit um, so it's really important if you are a healthcare professional thinking about what it is that you're trying to achieve and why are you doing it um, because it's they're expensive to use and if they are, have no efficacy um, then what is the purpose of them? We need to think about something else. So it may be that nourishing puddings may be better. Um, so it's really important when you're working as a healthcare professional to always think about your clinical practice and reflect on what you do and how you do it, um, to think about ways of improving because it constantly evolves. So this is a case study. So Mary is 76 years old. She's got COPD. She's got a height of 155 meters and she weighs 40 kilos. So normally in the morning, Mary has some cornflakes, she has semi-skim milk with a glass of orange juice, mid-morning she has a cup of tea, lunch, ham sandwich uh, using floral light, she has an apple, in the afternoon she has a cup of tea and a digestive biscuit, and the evening meal she has roast chicken, mashed potatoes, peas and carrots, and before she goes to bed she also has a cup of tea. So her diet only provides approximately 850 calories and 50 grams of protein. So her requirements are going to be an awful lot higher. So if you think, even though she's uh, an elderly lady, um, as we discussed earlier on, she probably hasn't got massive physical activity, but she probably still requires around 1800 calories per day. So what can we do? So we can fortify her diet. So we can tell, uh, advise her to have um, fortified milk. So we can add um, some skim milk powder to her to her milk uh, to make it more nutrient dense. So she could have cornflakes, fortified milk and orange juice. Mid morning, she could have a cup of tea and a little piece of cake. Um, lunch, she could have a ham and cheese salad sandwich uh, using butter rather than a light spread um, and an apple or a full, full cream yogurt. Mid afternoon, she could have a cup of tea and two digestive biscuits. And then her dinner of roast chicken, she could have um, roast chicken, mashed potato with grated cheese, peas and carrots. And then her evening drink could be supplemented with fortified milk made, um, Horlicks made with fortified milk. So this then takes her calorie intake up to 1600 calories and 75 grams of protein. So this is more nutritionally adequate for someone of her age. So it's almost double the energy. So it doesn't take much um, to tweak it. So malnutrition is really common. You can have a normal BMI, but still be malnourished. Um, so you can have um, you can have a very low um, lean body mass. Um, so often uh, individuals with cystic fibrosis may have a normal BMI, but they are um, they have a deficit of lean body mass. So they're just full of they just have fat mass. Um, so we should always use a food first approach and oral nutrition supplementation. Um, we would recommend it should only be used if fortification fails. And there's some extra reading if you're interested. Um, the NICE guideline 32, nutrition supports in adults, um, oral nutrition supplements, enteral tube feeding and parental nutrition from 2006. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and we'll look at children later on in the week. <laughs>